Hello, welcome to the Rubin Museum. Really happy to have you all with us here tonight for this exciting program. I'm Karenna Gore, and I am a fellow here at the Rubin Museum this season, helping to create the programming in a series that we've called Karma, Ancient Wisdom Meets the Future. So we're drawing from a diverse set of wisdom traditions, spiritual traditions, moral philosophy, in order to come up with a framework for thinking in an ethical way about these challenges that we're facing. And of course, it, my day job is at the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. So earth ethics are very central to what we are generally talking about. And that obviously includes climate change. So I'm so happy to have here tonight uh, two really great thinkers who have written a great deal and thought a great deal about drawing from ancient wisdom, moral philosophy, in order to really grapple with this problem. We have uh, Wen Stevenson and Roy Scranton. And I will say a word about each of them and then, um, and then let them each have the floor for a little bit. And then at the end, we'll have some time for question and answer. So Roy Scranton is the author of Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, Reflections on the End of a Civilization, War Porn, and We're Doomed, Now What? Essays on War and Climate Change. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, and The Nation, among other outlets. He teaches at the University of Notre Dame and holds an MA from the New School for Social Research and a PhD in English from Princeton. He's been awarding the Whiting, awarded the Whiting Fellowship in the Humanities and a Lannan Literary Fellowship. And I want to just actually uh, quote briefly from a little bit of Roy's writing, because it, this actually really so much touches on the theme of the whole series. This is from Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. In order for us to adapt to this strange new world, we're going to need more than scientific reports and military policy. We're going to need new ideas. We're going to need new myths and new stories, a new conceptual understanding of reality, and a new relationship to the deep polyglot traditions of human culture that carbon-based capitalism has vitiated through commodification and assimilation. So the deep polyglot traditions of human culture are part of that uh, moral philosophy and ancient wisdom that we are wanting to draw on. And in terms of this strange new world, of course what we're talking about is the fact that climate change is here. And climate impacts are being felt now with the stronger storms and the droughts and the heat waves, the rising sea levels and the like. People can look at the news even if they don't call it climate change and see that many of us have experienced it in our own lives in certain places seeing the change that is afoot. More than that, we have the recent release of reports. And these reports, such as the uh, report of the International Panel on Climate Change, which came out a month ago? A few uh, weeks ago. Just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And also the National yeah. Climate Assessment, which came out just last week. This is peer-reviewed from scientists all over the world and, uh, and the country. And there's a lot to be said about what, what is in these reports, but essentially the changes are happening faster than the scientists had previously thought. The time frame in which we can take action is smaller in order to stave off the worst of, of climate catastrophe. So that's what we're dealing with. And I want to read one other quote from Roy's work. The greatest challenge of the Anthropocene poses, the greatest challenge the Anthropocene poses isn't how the Department of Defense should plan for resource wars, whether we should put up seawalls to protect Manhattan, or when we should abandon Miami. It won't be addressed by buying a Prius, turning off the air conditioning, or signing a treaty. The greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with mortal humility to our new reality. Mm -hmm. And we also have Wen Stevenson, 
who is a frequent contributor to The Nation, the author of What We're Fighting For Now Is Each Other, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Climate Justice. And his essays and reporting on politics and culture have appeared in publications including The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, The New York Times, Slate, Baffler, Los Angeles Review of Books, among other places. He is also an editor and producer at what? the... Was. Oh, you were <laughs> an editor and producer at The Atlantic, PBS, Frontline, The Boston Globe, and NPR's On Point. And from Wen's writing, I would like to read, do miss are right that it's a no-win situation, depending on what you mean by win. If you mean stopping or solving climate change and preserving the world as we've known it, then the climate fight was lost a long time ago, maybe before it began. And yet science also tells us that even at this late date, some versions of losing could look far worse than others. We can still lose less badly. Not the most inspiring battle cry, perhaps, but when you understand the stakes, human survival, still a cause worth lifting a finger for. Let's hear from you first, Wen. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, first of all, let me just say um, thank you, Karenna and Roy. Uh, it's, it's really amazing to be sitting here, two people I respect and admire so much. Um, and also, uh, before I start, let me just address the elephant in the room, uh, which is this cap I'm wearing. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a Red Sox fan. Uh, my kids are Red Sox fans. My, uh, 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 my partner, my wife, who's here tonight, Fiona, is a Red Sox fan, and yeah, um, but I'll spare you my rendition of New York, New York. <laughs> so, um, wow. Um, so, maybe I'm not supposed to admit this uh, when I'm sitting here on a stage with a mic in my lapel, uh, but as I recently told uh, Karenna and Roy, uh, I don't know anymore what to say and write, much less do, um, as I stare into our climate and political abyss. <laughs> I mean, frankly, I don't really think any of us do. The situation is unprecedented. Uh, it's overwhelming. I mean, all bets are off. Uh, and for a lot of us trying to face this, uh, there can be a kind of paralysis, uh, a kind of blank, frozen, uh, deer in the headlights feeling, um, which is a pretty good description of how I oftentimes feel when I'm sitting face to face with my longtime Zen teacher, uh, a Zen master whose own teacher, uh, Sung San Sunim, uh, always emphasized what he called don't know mind. Don't know mind. What am I? Don't know. Only go straight. Don't know. And I'll be sitting there, and my teacher has given me a kung on or koan, you know, a kind of Zen riddle, and I'm stuck. I'm unable to answer, <clears throat> unable to move or speak until after several seconds. I just hit the floor with the palm of my hand, boom, and grunt, don't know. And my teacher smiles compassionately and shakes his head. You think too much. You read too many books. Put it all down. You already have the answer. Show me. Which, of course, is no help at all, given my attachment to words and thinking. And I fail again. So yes, as noted um, in the promotional materials, uh, I am a bad Buddhist uh, in more ways than one. In fact, and maybe I shouldn't admit this either, I don't know, but I'm such a bad Buddhist that I'm actually, uh, believe it or not, uh, a Christian of sorts. Uh, that's how bad a Buddhist I am, uh, but more on that later. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, um, so yes, bad Buddhist. Um, so it's with a it's with a keen uh, awareness of my own attachments and failings and limitations that I 
approach the question posed by our program tonight, which is itself a kind of koan, uh, you know, if we really are doomed, what would Buddha do? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, first of all, are we doomed? I know what Roy thinks. <laughs> um, no, I mean, what does that even mean? What is doom? You know, and who's the we in that statement? Um, these are all things that Roy, of course, thinks about all the time and, um, and has written brilliantly about. Uh, but in what sense have we, all of us, uh, ever not been doomed, right? I mean, isn't doom just another word for impermanence? But even if we're only speaking specifically in terms of climate catastrophe, is doom really the word for it? Uh, you know, uh, is it really a simple binary situation, doomed or not doomed? Um, according to climate science, of course, uh, it's almost certainly too late to stop, quote, catastrophic climate change on some scale. Uh, it's already happening. But that same science also tells us that there's still a wide range of possible outcomes, right? Just, um, just how catastrophic it will get uh, and how fast is unknown and still depends a great deal on what human beings do. Most importantly, what we do politically right now and in the coming years. And no matter what, human beings still have to live through the coming decades and centuries, however catastrophic they may be. And precisely because of that, our political choices and actions right now still matter a lot, maybe more than ever. So maybe it's better to say we're both doomed and not doomed, uh, or at least not entirely doomed, quite yet. Uh, so what then would Buddha do? I mean, the question really is um, like one of those classic old koans where if you try to answer it verbally, uh, the Zen master hits you. Right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what would Buddha do? Well, I mean, in order to answer that, uh, doesn't one need to know what Buddha is? <clears throat> I mean, of course, the question, what is Buddha, really is one of the oldest of koans, you know. <clears throat> what is Buddha? Uh, the great Chan master, Yunmen, when a monk asked him that very question, what is Buddha? Answered, dry shit on a stick. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> but maybe, uh, maybe Buddha is maybe a little more than that, or not only that, I hope. Um, maybe, maybe another way to pose the question, what is Buddha? And um, I'm sorry, here I go thinking too much again, but is to ask, you know, what is compassion? I mean, no compassion, no Buddha. No compassion, no Buddhism. Well, what is Buddha? What is compassion? Surely compassion is more than just a word, more than just uh, an abstract concept. Uh, so what is it then? Don't know? Well, as my teacher would say, just saying the words don't know won't cut it. Show me, right here, in this moment. You already have the answer. Even a child knows what compassion is. What is compassion? Someone is sad and needs a hug, you give them a hug. Someone is thirsty, you give them something to drink. Someone is sick, you tend to them. Someone is in danger, you protect them. Someone is suffering as a direct result of your actions or inaction. You try to change your behavior so that they will no longer suffer. Someone is suffering because of your government's actions or inaction, or because of the oppressive political system under which you live. You work with others and try to change your government or your whole political system. What would Buddha do? What is Buddha? Well, 
Maybe Buddha is simply compassionate direct action. Maybe Buddha is, simple as, is as simple as a hug and as hard as a revolution. There's an old saying, um, you know, uh, Zen is sitting, Zen is walking, Zen is lying down. So what would Buddha do? Don't know. But maybe Buddha would be sitting in. Maybe Buddha would be walking, marching in a crowd. Maybe Buddha would be lying down or locking down in front of pipelines and bulldozers and militarized police. Maybe Buddha would be shutting shit down. Maybe Buddha would revolt. Maybe Gandhi and everyone who was with Gandhi was Buddha. Maybe King and everyone with King was Buddha. Maybe everyone at Standing Rock was Buddha. Maybe Black Lives Matter and the Poor People's Campaign and Me Too and abolishing ICE and all those teachers who went on strike in West Virginia and Oklahoma are Buddha. Maybe all of us, including the police, are Buddha. If we only wake up and realize it. Or maybe we should just kill the Buddha and stop talking so damn much and just get on with what needs to be done. Are we doomed? Yes. <laughs> no. Don't know. <laughs> what would Buddha do? Don't know. But as my teacher would tell me, just saying don't know won't cut it. Because not knowing is not a reason for not acting compassionately to save our fellow beings from suffering. So just one last thing. Um, uh, at the end of my book, um, <clears throat> I, I recount this um, anecdote about the poet Gary Snyder. So in a piece called After Abamyan, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that properly, uh, which is about the destruction of the ancient Buddhas of Bamiyan in Afghanistan, um, Snyder recalls his correspondence with a, um, a fellow Buddhist who remarked that since Buddhism teaches the impermanence of all things, what did it really matter? <laughs> to which Snyder replies, ah, yes, impermanence. But this is never a reason to let compassion and focus slide or to pass off the sufferings of others because they are merely impermanent beings. And then Snyder quotes, a famous haiku by the Japanese poet Kobayashi Isa, which he translates, this dewdrop world is but a dewdrop world, and yet. And Snyder adds, that and yet is our perennial practice and may be the root of the Dharma. Are we doomed? What would Buddha do? Don't know. <laughs> and yet. Over to you, Roy. Thank you. Mm, thanks. <laughs> so should I just... Just begin. Yes, That's a, a tough act to follow. Uh, when <laughs> uh, so I also want to start by thanking Krenna and, and Tim and everybody at the Rubin who made this possible, and, and of course you all for coming tonight to participate in this conversation, and and to thank Wen for the invitation. Um, oh. I'm 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 here at your pleasure. So oh, thank hardly, you. But yeah. um, <laughs> uh, and my comments will overstep uh, uh, overlap uh, in certain ways with yours, when uh, but they take a different valence, I think, somewhat. Um, it's not quite true that there is nothing to say about climate change. What is true is that most of what there is to say has been said, often eloquently, over and over again over the past 30 years and more. Human beings have systematically and with unprecedented speed transferred vast amounts of carbon from underground into the atmosphere, 
only dimly aware until recent decades of the widespread and profound consequences of this activity. Scientists continue to elaborate our understanding of the paleoclimate record, looking at previous global transformations and extinction events in order to get a better sense of what we might expect from our future, while also working diligently, underfunded and underappreciated and under attack from denialist trolls and well-funded fossil fuel industry proxies to understand the meteorological, geological, and biological processes we have initiated, including Arctic sea ice collapse, glacier melt, the thawing of methane and carbon frozen in Arctic permafrost and in clathrates under the Arctic Ocean, transformations in global weather patterns such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, and the polar jet streams, sea level rise, changes in crop yields and animal migration patterns, and so on. But the general outline of the situation seems to be fairly clear. The massive carbon transferal we call industrialization or modernization has begun a range of geophysical processes that are over the next several decades and for thousands of years after going to radically transform the lived environment on Earth in ways that will almost certainly be destructive to human global civilization and may well prove inimical to human life as such. The social and political consequences of this quote unquote global warming, which phrase, while accurate enough on its face, in no way communicates the complex cascading implications of the processes that we are even today living through are almost certain to prove catastrophic. Increasing political polarization, militarization, authoritarianism, war, social collapse, displacement, famine, the breakdown of global agriculture, energy and transport infrastructure, resurgent nationalism and sectarianism, and possibly new genocidal efforts toward human population management. We see this future emergent in today's headlines, and there seems to be little we can do to avoid it. This last point brings up the question of humanity's capacity for organized collective action in response to the emergent situation we've inadvertently created, the discussion of which remains ironically not only one of the most fruitless and dispiriting fora for denial available to those who refuse to confront the ramifications of what science is telling us, but also one of the most active arenas for the fervent, even zealous assertion of carbon capitalism's techno-utopian ideology. Since the twin catastrophes of the French Revolution and the invention of the steam engine, the idea of infinite human, moral, and social progress, grounded, grounded in the manifest technological change, fueled by cheap energy made available first by coal, then by oil, embodied in the miraculous technologies of the factory, the locomotive, the airplane, and the family car, has infected nearly every aspect of human culture across the world, transforming ideas about time, space, agency, freedom, and what human life means, undermining and effacing thousands of years of accumulated wisdom. Those who today insist that yes, we can solve climate change are adherents of this modern thought as much as are those who insist that we can make America great again. All believers <laughs> in a human capacity to rationally transform the world for the better. All apostles of a faith that human will can transcend death. They grow increasingly strident as evidence to the contrary, namely catastrophic anthropogenic global warming, grows increasingly undeniable. We are fundamentally, existentially, mortal beings. The fate of every man, woman, and non-binary gendered person is death. Our lives are caught up in persistent, confused cycles of desire and suffering. There is no ultimate solution, technological or otherwise, to the fundamental problems of human existence. <clears throat> Suffering, evil, cruelty, short-sightedness, ignorance, arrogance, desire, mortality. I probably skipped over a few. <laughs> There's only the question of how to live our limited lives in this chaotic world in such a way as to keep them open to and even foster possibilities for peace, communion, compassion, and joy. What is there to say about climate change that has not been said about the human condition countless times before by bodhisattvas, philosophers, and poets? It is true that this apocalypse is new, unique in human history, unique in the geological history of the planet. 
Never before has so much carbon been transferred into the atmosphere so quickly. Never before has a truly global civilization had to face its imminent collapse. Even the threat of human extinction through nuclear war, which emerged in the middle of the 20th century, remained as it remains for us today mere potential, never achieving the inevitability that global warming for all intents and purposes now has. Science tells us that even if we were to stop emitting carbon dioxide entirely across the world today, a fantastic prospect on its face, we would still expect two or even three degrees Celsius warming because of the carbon already in the oceans and atmosphere. And the paleoclimate record suggests that once we warm the planet to that point, it is probably impossible to stop the feedback mechanisms that have already been activated, such as permafrost melt and Arctic sea ice collapse. Which means that even if we transformed the global economy with a Green New Deal for all of Earth's nearly 200 nations and all of its more than 7 billion people right now, this very moment, it is almost certainly already too late to save global capitalist civilization. Almost certainly too late, that is, to save the world as we know it. Almost certainly already too late to save ourselves. What's there to say? Freed from the myth of salvation, especially that version predicated on technological progress, we are free to ask what there might be to say in the face of human mortality. How do we conduct our lives in the fact of our transience? This is not a new question. And the answer lies not in speech, but in action. Silence. Meditation. Attention. Love. Once we accept the proper role of scientific understanding in human life, which is to describe and predict natural phenomena, not to tell us what to do or what it means, we can see that beyond empirical claims about climate change, there's really not much left to say. We're not in control of this situation. And what freedom we might have for action can only be found through inaction, stillness, silence, the interruption of our reactive engagement and collective cycles of fear and desire. We have nothing to say. We have to say nothing. Perhaps we ought to keep saying it. Thank you. <laughs> so, although perhaps we ought to just say nothing, um, <laughs> I would. These people really pay good money for us <laughs> to say something. <laughs> I would really like to invite Wen to ask a question yeah. in response to that. Sure. Um, I have mm. so many. Mm. I have so many questions uh, for Roy. But um, um, yeah, well, one of the, and I've noticed this in uh, reading um, the essays in For Doom Now What? Oh, by the way, may I? Can I tell you something kind of funny? OK. All right. So see these two books? OK. The title of this, this book was once going to be, We're Fucked, Now What? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And good, good when my editor was like, OK, I'm going to present this, you know? I'm just like, and, and are you really ready to do this? Or should we really present it? I was like. I had this picture of my evangelical Christian mom, you know, <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and like how I could inscribe this book to my mom, you know, and no, nah, it just wasn't going to happen. So anyway, so, so see there, Roy, we are on the same page. Yeah. We are on the same no. page. Yeah, no, but uh, so especially the ending, by the way, 
I don't know if this was intentional or not, but I love the art of, um, of uh, spoken word. And I loved how you were talking really fast, rapid fire at the beginning, just spewing out all that information to us. And by the end, you would slow down. Mm -hmm. And there were these long pauses between your words. And I was like, isn't that beautiful? That was beautiful. <laughs> OK. Um, oh, wow. So I'm stalling here. I'm stalling, you can tell. Uh, OK. So no. So especially by the time we get to the end of your comments there, it raises something for me that has been uh, really uh, you know, a constant question for me as I combine you know, something like a, like a Buddhist practice uh, my, uh, as a Zen Buddhist uh, student, um, and activism. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, and of course, a, there is a tradition of engaged, right? of engaged Zen, engaged Buddhism. There's nothing um, strange about that. Um, but it's this tension between uh, withdrawal and a kind of quietism, mm -hmm. right? And the need for action, the need, the need to actually act in the world um, in order, because we are in the world, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the same impulse that it's the bodhisattva way, right? Mm -hmm. It's the <laughs> not just uh, floating off into my bliss, you know, on a cloud, but actually coming back into the world um, and trying to help other beings. And so I wonder if you, if you feel that tension too, you know, uh, when you, you're not entirely, I think you want to be taken seriously, but maybe not literally when you say we should say nothing or do nothing, you know? Um. So I, I do feel that tension, and that's part of why I feel the need to even say it in the first place. If, right, right. Uh, if I felt that um, our culture or um, even my own life had enough space to actually spend, um, like, to, to spend the proper, or I don't know if there's a proper amount of time, but to spend enough time in meditation or in attention and just, like, in just being in the world and attending to it instead of reacting to things, mm. um, then I don't know that I would feel such a, such a need to articulate the case for it. Um, and especially with regard to what we consider to be politics, right? And, and with regard, and especially with regard to climate change, right? Like the, the, the pressures we face um, in countless arena uh, from from our social interactions to Twitter to, um, you know, to, to what we see happening in the world around us, right, compel us, compel us because of our connection to react, right? They compel us to action. Um, and I think it's often the case that that, that action would be more efficacious and probably more thoughtful if we took time to, took more time to reflect and took more time to um, withdraw and, and attend to, I don't know, attend to being itself, right? Mm -hmm. to, to make space for that, mm -hmm. that kind of thought. Um, so that's something I feel like I have to argue for, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is itself a kind of action, right? There's no... Um, you know, it's a uh, talking to you and you and everyone, right? This is a social activity I'm engaged in. I'm not meditating right now. Exactly. Um, so that tension is is alive and part of the discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Good. All right. Well, I. I was listening to you and thinking that the word almost, when you say almost certainly too mm -hmm. late, yeah. uh, is an important word. Um, and I wonder if you might explain what you mean about the science. I mean, I think many of us are familiar in general mm. with the science. When you say it's almost certainly too late to save ourselves. Yeah. Do you mean, what about the world as we know it and we're used to it is going to be for sure gone? And, and what, uh, what do we have some, some chance? And also just to acknowledge that, that, that there is some unknown here and to actually ask you how much unknown and should we interrogate mm -hmm. that a little bit more? 
Well, I mean, the future is, is inherently unknown. I mean, that's, that's just essential to it being the future, right? But, um, but we can make guesses uh, and this is what science is for, right? Like it's part of what it does is it makes, it's able to make predictions about the future based on past evidence and based on probabilities and based on where things seem to be going. Um, you know, looking at the paleoclimate record, looking at times when carbon has been moved into the atmosphere previously. Um, and, and, you know, looking at times when the earth has undergone these kinds of massive transformations like the one that we've, we've initiated. Uh, it doesn't, you know, science saying that like it's been this way before and so it's probably going to be like this next time isn't the full extent of the future, right, which remains unknown and it's totally, I suppose, right, imaginable, right, that we could develop um, carbon scrubbers at scale within the next five years that could just suck carbon out of the atmosphere and shoot it into space or something, right? Um, or turn it into free energy, right? I mean, there's like crazy stuff happens. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's impossible to absolutely predict. But, um, you know, we make decisions based on, based on likely outcomes, right? So, you know, if, if, you to if you're told there's a 90% chance of rain, you bring an umbrella, right? <laughs> um, and so, Looking at, at what the science has to say, um, from what I've read of the science now, um, and looking at our political situation, nationally, globally, looking at the amount of time it's taken historically to make energy transitions, right? Like the hundred years it took to change from a primarily coal-based energy infrastructure to primarily oil-based. Um, you know, the, the probability is that everything is going away, right? Everything is that, is that we are going to, um, you know, it's going to be two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. It's just going to keep getting worse. Within what time frame are you? It's, yeah, I mean, so I'm not a, I'm not a climate scientist, so, um, but that, so, We've, we've put enough carbon into the atmosphere already, right, that we should expect two to three degrees Celsius warming at least um, above pre-industrial levels. And there's, there's a lot of reason, a lot of evidence in the paleoclimate record to suspect that that's not a stable point for the, for the Earth's geophysical systems, right? And so that once you start that, um, we'll keep going. And what's more, right, uh, because of the feedback mechanisms, and what's more, like, the, 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 the probability that we're going to stop emitting carbon seems pretty much, I mean, I don't, this isn't a scientific <laughs> estimate, this is looking at our society and thinking mm -hmm. about inertia and politics and history. Um, Realistically, it seems if we, if we, even if we did want to completely change the global economic energy system to a primarily renewable slash nuclear um, system, that's going to take decades, right? So we face, so we're looking at decades of additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, right? And then, and at some point, we're going to, that's going to activate all the carbon and methane in the permafrost, which is already melting. Right, and, it, and at some point we face the prospect of activating the, the, the methane gun, the methane clathrate gun, right? Uh, even more methane right. under the ocean, right? And so, and, and what we're talking about is, it's not just things get warmer, right? This is the issue, is that it's, it's a cascading series of, of follow-on effects that we have never experienced as a species, and certainly never experienced with the kind of um, interconnected, precarious, highly complex society that we live in now, right? Our society is 
our, the, the, the global society that we live in is, is robust in certain ways, but it's also very, very fragile, very, very dependent on um, technological resources and the free flow of carbon and uh, uh, various, various other factors. And so when that starts to fall apart, right, um, as, as has been seen repeatedly, right, with highly complex societies, when they hit moments of crisis, it all falls apart very quickly, right? And so that seems to be what probabilistic, probabilistically we should expect to happen. Um, you know, I can't tell you, like, you've got 10 years, right? Or, you know, or that it's going to be like six degrees warmer in 20 years. I, you know, um, the, I do know that, for example, the, the Arctic is collapsing faster than it should be, right? Uh, according to models, right? I know that, that <clears throat> the scientific models and estimates tend to be fairly conservative, right? Because of what they don't know about what we're doing, right? And that the paleoclimate record shows that in times in the past, when these kinds of transitions have been initiated, they can happen very quickly um, on a scale of decades. Um, and that never before in the paleoclimate record has so much carbon been moved into the atmosphere so quickly. Mm -hmm. So we're in, we're in unprecedented, we're in uncharted waters. We, we can literally, we cannot know what's going to happen, right? But we can be pretty certain that it's going to be very, very difficult for mm -hmm. human beings. Yeah, difficult. it's it's yeah. it's interesting because I, I I hear from other people in the climate movement who emphasize optimism and hope and point to the um, the decreasing cost and in mm. rising availability of renewable energy mm -hmm. and uh, point to certain things. Obviously, the Paris Agreement and say there is this cause for for hope, but I. I don't see any disagreement on the fundamental science at right. all and, and the feedback yeah. loops. So it very much goes to the point of making meaning, which is something yeah. that you talk about um, a lot in your book, and also um, how, we, how we have frameworks for, for thinking about this, including the sort of ethical and moral framework, mm. um, and the existential one. Uh, why are we here in the first place on Earth? And I wanted to uh, turn to you, Wen, because you have written a lot about the climate movement and the climate justice movement in particular. And in your book, what, are, what We're Fighting For Now Is Each Other, you also say it's important to be very honest. We don't want to paint a rosy picture and say uh, that, that we're on the right track with climate change and we should all be optimistic because that wouldn't be honest regarding the science, uh, but in the politics but that we need to also recognize that we're fighting for something other than just winning in that sense, that we're gonna completely defeat this, this problem. Uh, and also that there are, there are reasons to change this carbon-based extractionist economy other than just climate change. It's also causing harm to people in other ways. So I wondered if you might elaborate a little bit mm. on uh, the, the experiences that you've had. And I know also you've yourself been an activist, arrested in nonviolent right. civil disobedience action, spent a lot of time on front lines. So we'd just love to hear from you a little bit about what that movement is, is like and how you see it. Oh boy, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I just, I wanna say that was an amazing uh, riff you did there, um, <laughs> Roy. And, and I, I think, Pretty much everything you said there, I agree with. I think it's plausible. I think it's accurate. But what, I have to say one, maybe, and mm -hmm. we shouldn't, we don't want to get into a debate about this right now because neither one of us are climate scientists. So, um, but my understanding is that the current business as usual trajectory mm -hmm. from the IPCC and others um, is, is, is if emissions stayed on their currently upward, mm -hmm. still upward path globally, we would um, be around four degrees by 2100. Mm -hmm. um, and that in this crazy hypothetical scenario where emissions shut off right now, yeah. we would still, we would overshoot 1.5 and maybe one and maybe even two, mm -hmm. but would eventually, if there were no car more carbon emissions, we would eventually come back down. And so that's why the whole idea of um, the only way the IPCC can in any way rationally state 
that it would still be possible to hold war <laughs> limit warming to two degrees um, is if we actually were to more or less zero out carbon emissions by wow. mid-century or so, mm -hmm. overshoot two degrees, and then through uh, massive negative, negative emissions, emissions yeah. so technologies to draw, not just technologies, also natural, all sorts of natural car enhancing and preserving and, and enlarging natural carbon sinks, um, draw emissions back down. We could right. get the new president of Brazil to build there you more go. forests. Right. And so, so, uh, so but, but, it, but, but I think you're, but your, oh, your overall point is exactly, I, I still think it's exactly right. So whatever yeah. the degree number is, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's three, four, five, six, whatever, um, those, those matter, of course. Yeah. But whatever that may be, I totally agree, and this is absolutely relevant to the question. I'm not evading your no, question. No, no, I, I like um, what you're doing. I absolutely agree. And actually, most of the climate activists that I work with um, uh, would agree mm -hmm. uh, that what, what we are now heading for is truly catastrophic mm -hmm. on a global scale. Um, but that this word, <laughs> this concept of catastrophe is, 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 uh, covers a lot of ground, you know? Mm -hmm. And that every degree of warming that is uh, prevented may very may, notice I say may, uh -huh. I'm not saying will, I say may actually matter in terms of the global outcomes. And so therefore, with that, still that level of uncertainty in what the future holds, you know, if we, if we were to actually um, do anything close to what the IPCC is calling for, uh, it's like, well, how can we not try? You know, so that's, that's the basic position, right, of yeah. those of those realistic climate activists who are saying, yeah, yeah, we're screwed, um, but there's enough uncertainty in what's ahead of us that we can still affect the outcome enough that we might actually be able to save billions of lives, you know, if we were to prevent absolute, you know, runaway, because we don't yeah. know where the tipping points are exactly, right. and we don't yeah. know. So. No, so, but I mean, so yeah. I, I, I hear that, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and sympathetic to that, um, but it's been a consistent, uh, critique of the, I, I mean, first of all, the IPCC reports right, sort of offer a range, and, and it's been a consistent critique that they um, are extremely conservative about the feedback mechanisms that are, yep. that are yep. already happening and, and not well understood. Right, 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 right. Scientists are working very hard right now to understand the methane that's coming out of Alaska, Alaskan permafrost Absolutely. and, and yep. lakes in Siberia. Um, and, and that's happening now. There's, there's at least twice as much carbon in Arctic permafrost as we've already put into the right. atmosphere. <laughs> right, exactly. And so when that comes, that's coming out. It's right. coming out now. But, it, but they do say and it would take a long time. It's not actually know. a bomb. Well, they, but, but, so, but, yeah. but we don't know what happens when we put this much carbon into that the atmosphere. That is absolutely true. Right. And heat up the planet like right. this. As Terry so, Emanuel, one of the- And, and yeah, have sorry. forest fires yeah. in Canada and, and exactly. all this stuff that's happening. Right. So, it's kind of know, cascading It's, it's cascading. Right. And, it may be that we could conceivably, uh, if we completely revamped the global economy, um, got the Brazilian president on our side, <laughs> and started right. working on negative emissions, that we could slow down warming to the point where we could keep it within some reasonable... That might be possible, but there's also strong evidence that suggests that once you start, once you get to two degrees, those yes, you've, you're over the tipping point, right? Right, right. And the permafrost and the methane yep. and I all the it. stuff, it's that it's too late by then, which means, which means really it's too late right now, um, possibly. So does that so, mean so, that so, I'm saying when you we're, say we're, it in, we're in an in the, yeah. we're, it's we don't know, <laughs> you know, right, but like, right. right. Um, you know, I hear you. I, I hear you. Yep. So, 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 given all of that, and, yeah. and when you when you when you state it that way, I'm really I'm with you. I'm with yeah, you. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, back to the should climate we, movement, right. because I do not think we can have any kind of conversation about the climate movement and climate politics without acknowledging what Roy is saying. Okay. I mean, as Tim de Christopher, I don't know how many people know who Tim de Christopher is, but he's a big voice in my book. Um, he's a, you know, a, a kind of famous climate activist who um, 
back in 2008. He's kind of the one who really got the ball rolling on civil disobedience, nonviolent direct action around climate. Right? In 2008, he kind of monkey wrenched a federal auction, uh, BLM auction of oil and gas drilling leases in, on public land in Utah. And he went in and bid, and went in and, and started bidding on the, on the auction and actually ended up winning like millions of dollars worth of land that he couldn't pay for. Uh, and he went to prison. He went to prison for two years. Uh, and so I kind of know Tim quite well, actually. And um, uh, he's, a, he's a major uh, voice in, in, in my book. And one of the things he constantly says, right, is that, you know, we have to face the reality that we are now heading into a catastrophic situation. And possibly, possibly the end, the end of everything. You know, the collapse of our civilization, maybe even humanity, right? And, and, that, um, and that what's the point, he likes to say, like what's the point of a movement? What's the point of a social movement that can't tell the truth, you know? Like how can we actually be effective climate activists if we're not actually dealing with reality. Yeah. There is something deflating. Totally, right? right. Like I said, not exactly an inspiring this. battle cry. <laughs> right. But anyway, so I just yeah. want you to, to address that as part of your answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it is, right? Um, another thing that I've talked about with many climate activists, Tim and many other people, is that all of the folks who got to the point where they were ready to take serious direct action um, went through despair. We're still in despair, really. And that the action uh, that they took and, and their, the way they reoriented their, reoriented their lives around, around um, uh, radical uh, politics and radical movement building uh, was, in, was, was actually the result of coming, having gone through despair, right? Um, and again, that's sort of the point that, that we'll never be as effective and as as, as, as radical, really, as we need to be if we don't go through that process of facing reality, okay? But, but, here's the thing. While, while you know, we emphasize the kind of <laughs> increasingly small, uh, you know, range of, of possibility when it comes to the science and the window of opportunity and all of that, I also think there's a flip side to that when it comes to the social and political, okay? I think that while it's true that the IPCC has always been too conservative and, and neglecting to talk about the tipping points because they're just too damn scary, uh, at the same time, I think that, I think most of our projections about what is actually politically possible and socially possible are too, whatever you want to call it, too, too uh, pessimistic or too conservative um, not acknowledging, you know, the kinds of truly revolutionary radical changes that have happened in, in history that were really unforeseen at the time by people who lived in that historical moment, you know, just didn't see them coming. Uh, and the fact that the situation is unprecedented, I mean, we've never really faced this kind of, uh, of emergency, you know, suggests that, well, perhaps the human social political response to this might also be unprecedented. Um, I'm not saying it's probable. <laughs> See, this is, a, you know, this, is, this is the thing, right? Like, I'm not, yeah. we're only talking about, uh, you know, likelihoods or possibilities or probabilities, whatever. And to me, that's what is liberating about this, right? Is that uh, we don't know. And so there are still possibilities that, you know, uh, that we don't really know what is possible, so. But I want to ask you, so, yeah. uh, and I was really, uh, you know, I was touched by some of the things you, you said before about where you're taking work, and I was also uh, touched by this, you're, you're banging the, <laughs> the arm of the chair, I don't right. know. Um, right. But also, because, um, you know, there's the question of, you know, of what, what action to take, right? Like, we, there's so much that we don't know, right? What action do we take? I've, I, you know, I, I've got an 18-month-old daughter at home, so I've only got so many hours a day, right? There's a lot going on. I've got 
to grade papers. I've got to <laughs> take her to daycare. Whatever. Just there's a bunch of stuff going on. I, there's only... And, but this is not my problem. Like, we're all finite, mortal, limited beings with only so many, so many hours, mm -hmm. so much time, and these problems, right? Like, to, to, to transform the global energy infrastructure, <laughs> right? right? Like, who has the time? <laughs> right. But, like, not even that. But, <laughs> but if we only have so much time, right? right? And... And the probability is that looking historically, looking at the science, looking at these things, the probability is that we're not going to get it together as a, as a global, as a, as a set of global actors, right, to stop climate change in time. And things right. are going to get very bad very quickly. Right. And there's going to be all these follow-on effects, which are going to affect, which are going to include, you know, um, you know, locking people up at borders and, and killing them. And we already are. We already are. And it's going to include people dying because of storms and uh, a lack of uh, state support, right, uh, it, for disaster relief. They already are, right? And over and over again. Alex Cora's hometown. Yeah. In so, Puerto Rico. So we're going right. to see all these effects on, happening in, in sort of humanitarian or other fields that we wouldn't, we, that aren't climate change activism, right? Where should we, where would Buddha put his energy? I'm right? so glad you asked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Um, so, okay. This is where I might get an audible gasp from any climate movement people in the audience. Um, uh, but, I mean, and this actually shouldn't be that surprising to someone who read my book or has read my recent essays. I don't know if anybody has, but um, uh, I think the climate movement's time, moment, as a climate movement, has passed. I'm not sure that what we need anymore is a climate movement or even a climate justice movement, okay? Uh, I mean, one of the points in my book among the people who really talk about climate justice, right, which includes inc is the intersectional understanding of how you approach climate, climate catastrophe, right? I mean, uh, that it's about racial justice and economic justice and gender justice and all of these things. Um, so part of the point of that is that, and, and, and another, another big point there is that uh, the reason we're at this stage Right, that it's gotten to this point is that our mm -hmm. political system has proven itself completely unable to deal with this. Yeah. Um, you know, our laws are written by the fossil fuel industry. Yes. You know, uh, there was this actually almost perversely beautiful moment when Donald Trump appointed Rex Tillerson yeah. as <laughs> Secretary of State. Right? I mean, it's like, okay, this is what we've been trying to tell you. Uh, that the fossil fuel industry is running our government, you know, or our foreign policy or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now there's no denying it, okay? <laughs> right. um, so, so, yeah, so the fact that the, politi the political system is incapable, as, as we currently have it, is incapable of actually addressing this in an in a, in a, in a adequate way, um, and the fact, I'll go on to say, that uh, the point about climate justice is that a mere climate movement, or that is to say, a, a political movement or social movement that's founded exclusively or primarily even around climate change, right, will never be powerful enough on its own to overcome the power of the fossil fuel industry and change our political system to the point that we can actually address this adequately, right? So the whole point of this was always that what we need is actually uh, a, a, a truly broad-based um, social justice and human rights movement that can actually, uh, you know, build the kind of power necessary uh, to change our political system, right? Uh, in time, that's the key thing, right? In time, right? Mm -hmm. It's a really hard part. Um, uh, so I think given what has happened in the past, just the past couple of years, given the election of Donald Trump, given uh, the increasingly grim science, I, I'll go back to what I, what I said in my opening comments there. Uh, 
uh, no matter what, right, even if it is utterly, absolutely too late to prevent catastrophic warming, um, our political choices and actions now matter more than ever because the only thing that I can think of worse than a climate catastrophe is living into a climate catastrophe within, the ne within mere decades under a racist, uh, uh, militarized, oligarchic uh, political system that is heading toward, if not already embracing, fascism, right? The only thing worse than climate catastrophe is climate catastrophe plus fascism, right? Which is what we have, right? Uh, we have the beginnings of that. When you shoot tear gas at women and children who are basically climate refugees, mm -hmm. You know, on the borders of the United States, all right? What is that? Um, so, so the climate movement as just a climate movement, mm -hmm. I don't think it's even suited to the task at hand um, because the task at hand is actually a revolution, right? I don't really mean metaphorically. Like, I don't mean the green revolution or the, the clean energy revolution or or even the political revolution. I, I kind of do mean the political revolution, but I think I mean something even more than what Bernie Sanders was talking about. Right? Talking about an actual democratic human rights revolution. I mean, my, my models are Gandhi and King. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would like to see happen. Um, I hope, you know, I hope that people pushing for that kind of a revolution wouldn't turned to violence, but I can guarantee uh, that violence would be turned on them. And so that anyone who's actually serious about this statement should be willing to face that, you know, face that fact. Uh, and I also will clearly admit that I think this, if we're talking about probabilities, again, I think what I'm saying is totally, it's unlikely to happen. It's unlikely to happen. But that if you're actually the type of person who wants to take political action at this time, right? I can't really take you seriously unless you're talking in terms of revolution. What, so, what so, kind yeah. of revolution do you mean? Well, you asked the question. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yes. You, 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 um, and then I so, think I wanted to yeah. ask you all because they, we, yeah. we do want to leave some time for yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you well, asked so, him. So one, one question I have about that, and, and so I've thought about this some, and, and I don't know, um, you know, I don't know as much about uh, the specifics with Gandhi's situation as, as I would like to, but mm. I do know that the civil rights movement um, was, was able to be effective. Um, Nonviolence was able to be effective in part because of America's geo, geostrategic situation in the Cold War, right? And its, its <laughs> yep. advancement of freedom and democracy as opposed to... Um, you know, Soviet repression, and also in distinction to uh, right. the Nazi racial eugenics of, of uh, World War II, right? right? right. Um, and so the, I mean, federal marshals, the National Guard, the, the, the 101st Airborne w were sent to the South to protect protesters, right? So the, the U.S. government was federally involved uh, in protecting the civil rights movement because of its ideological commitments to a geopolitical situation. Um, and that's part of what allowed the civil rights movement to be as successful as it was, which I think we should all recognize is still um, only went so far, oh, of course. right? Right, 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 um, right. And, and, you know, imprisonment and so on. The situation today is, is uh, it, abominable, right, with regard to just general civil rights, uh, but especially incarceration. Um, but so if you talk about, and then and Gandhi too, the Gandhi's movement um, was emergent in a particular historical moment of um, British imperial retreat. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that too was, had a kind of strategic value for empire, as it, as it were, right? Um, but, but what you're talking about is a movement against the, what seems to me the, the, the heart and soul of American power as such, mm. right? And so I don't, 
how, how do you see the climate movement sort of, like how do you see this revolution, right, being able to occupy the same space of moral high ground that is able to stand on or activate an existing geopolitical language. Yeah, yeah. Right, in order to make its claims heard. Right. You know, right. With, without, yeah, because it, the, I, 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 I don't see a way forward there. I, you know, I don't... Um, well, like I said, I don't see the climate <laughs> movement doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That was actually, it wasn't designed to do that. Yeah. Designed. I mean, nobody designed a climate movement, but whatever. Um, uh, we should take questions. In should we? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sure. 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 Yeah. I'm sure we've got some. But um, we, we just, yeah, just, night, just yeah. quickly. So, I think, I mean, what you're saying, you know, wisely, is that you know, there's not a historical precedent for what I'm talking about, mm. <laughs> which is actually exactly what the IPCC just said in its uh, mm. in its last report that the radical changes required in the global economy and energy infrastructure have no historical precedent, yeah. right? Um, um, so, so that's, that's fully acknowledged. Um, uh, I think that though, for the people living at that moment, in, the, in those historical moments, okay, and I, I think that actually abolitionism, the abolitionist movement and mm -hmm. the, the end of slavery in both uh, um, the British Empire, maybe even mm -hmm. especially the British mm -hmm. Empire, um, and in the United States might even be the best uh, analog, but I don't really believe in these analogs, all right? Mm -hmm. But that, that went to the apps, especially the British Empire, it went directly at, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the heart of the whole global economy mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, in today's dollars, trillions of dollars, you know, of, of, uh, of wealth, you know, um, uh, disappeared. <clears throat> Not, not disappeared, but um, so I think to people at, in those historical moments, the, they, they couldn't see a way, a way forward either, you know? Uh, to them, the idea of abolishing slavery uh, globally was a utter pipe dream, you know? It was, you know, how could that possibly, how could that possibly happen? They didn't, under, they didn't have the, our vantage point to see what were the cultural and historical forces, you know, uh, moving at that time that were going to make it possible, right? And I think that we have to, we have to understand that we're, we're like that, you know? Uh, we don't know. I mean, there's never been a, a global generation of young people ever in the history of humanity, right, that, that is coming into political consciousness right now with what they are staring at. So we, don't, we actually don't know. How, how they're going to respond, you know, as, as things get worse and worse. Remember, remember, though, that I'm not one of those people saying that <clears throat> they're going to respond and we're going to solve the climate crisis, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm not saying that, <laughs> right? I'm saying that we might be able to lose less badly. 